Okay, cool. What do you wish? All right. So it's uh, Sunday, uh, March 3rd, 2019, and we're up here um, at the lodge at the woods on Lovely Road, or Ehlers Road, technically, right? Up at the woods. Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. All right. And so we're going to uh, do a little oral history interview with my dad, Lee Nelson. So what's your full name? My full name is Lee Edward Nelson. The Edward is my father's name, middle name, I should say. Cool. So family tradition, I guess. Except for me. I got the Eugene, so the Edward, but yeah. whatever. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Um, we didn't like you anyway, so... <laughs> oh, oh, the truth oh, comes man. out, finally. Oh, when and where were you born? I was born in Detroit, Michigan in 1932, just uh, shortly be after the start of the Big Depression. And I do not know whether I was born at home or not. My sister, I know, was born at home because I vividly, rem vividly remember the doctor asking my brother if he wanted a, a baby sister, and his answer was an emphatic, nah! <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's going to be a tough life for my son here. Uh, uh, tell me about your parents or your family background. Uh, my father's father came from Sweden, and my mother's father uh, or great or grandfather came from Germany. I believe how we got here was that person was a mercenary, and I believe he was in O. o. Howard's division on the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg. Unfortunately, he caught a slug. Uh, but fortunately, he was one of the few who lived uh, long enough to get the 160 acres or whatever it was the government gave soldiers. And so, as was the custom in those days, once they got settled, they sent for brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles and all the, the family eventually came over here to Michigan. Some of them stopped in Ohio on the way up. But uh, that's what I know about our family's arrival in the, in the new world. Mm. What did your parents do for a living? During World War I, my mother was a secretary and my father was what I call a reluctant soldier or maybe a poor soldier. He didn't like army life and uh, let it be known in various ways. During World War II, my mother again worked in a defense plant, uh, who, which um, made, I believe, 20, 20 millimeter or 40 millimeter shells, cannon shells. And uh, my father worked in a defense plant making uh, tanks. Hmm. Oh, boy. Did you contribute to the family income or help? parents earn money and by working I, I when worked, you were young? When I was young, I worked, uh, when we lived in Detroit, uh, I worked uh, uh, as a paper boy and brought home some money and helped my dad, who by then was in the construction business, remodeling homes would be a better way of putting it or building them, and helped him there. Uh, I was a gopher for all of his tools. Lee, go for this. Lee, get me that. But it was an education, too. You learned uh, names of tools, and you learned what their purpose was. And uh, it was kind of fun to be with Dad working, you know, big boy type stuff. Hmm. Uh, were your, is your family religious? Uh, depends on which member of the family you're talking about. We were from Germany, from southern Germany, the Catholic part of Germany, and uh, my mother was quite religious. My father was uh, not so religious. And uh, my, I have a cousin who is very religious, and one of them is a nun. 
So it uh, it depended on the person involved. Uh-huh. Uh, were your parents politically active, to your knowledge, or? No, no uh, n not politically active as being a registered member of this party or that party, but uh, this was at the start or in the Big Depression, which made my father an avid de Democrat for the rest of his life. My mother did not express to me uh, preference for a political party, but I can men mention that she was a suffragette going out on the street in the streets to uh, uh, work to, to get the, the vote privilege for women. She actually went out and demonstrated in the street. That's yes. kind of yes, that that way. She was one of the groundbreakers, I guess you would call her. Wow, where you know where she would be living at that time? Was she in Michigan? She, she would have been uh, uh. In Detroit area, she worked before the or during the war. There, I mentioned that already, uh, and uh, I I can't tell you exactly uh, when the suffragette movement was at its height, but I do know that she was in it at that time. Hmm. Interesting. By the way, my father was born in 1890. Okay. My mother was born in 1894 or thereabouts, and my father's birth certificate burned up in one of the great forest fires that ravaged M Michigan at that time. Huh. He was born in Detroit, or? No, uh, he would have been born in Oscoda, Michigan. Oscoda, okay. Because his father came over and worked as a lumberman, and uh, my grandmother came to, and when she was 16 years old, from the area around Berlin, Germany, and worked as a domestic. And I marvel at the fact that she could travel across the ocean all by herself at 16 years of age. That would be your father's mother? Or your, no, your uh, mother's mother? he, my father's your father. mother, yes. Right. Okay, got it. So she was born in Germany? Germany. In Berlin, okay. And we spoke uh, uh, a little bit of German at home, uh, family jokes, uh, and uh, it's like Spanglish today. <laughs> I don't know what the German equivalent is, but uh, my father's mother uh, died of, the, of um, tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my father was very close to her, and uh, he spoke more German than my mother did. I remember as a kid, you would say, Mach schnell, Mach schnell, when, Mar <laughs> when we kids would be dawdling. Or... And, and he never schnelled. <laughs> <laughs> or Mein Gotten Himmel. When yeah, I, Mein Gotten Himmel. I say that too, like when I hit my thumb with a hammer, I, I have these little German Yiddish <laughs> phrases that come out of my mouth, and I'm like, where did these come from? Like, oh, it's you. You used to say these sort of things. Uh, anything else about your grandparents that you can remember? Uh, I remember my grandmother, uh, who died in 1936 when I was four years old, very vaguely, very vaguely. But I remember a story my mother told about her, which was that when I was born, my grandmother came to see me, and when the uh, ooing and eyeing were done, my grandmother said to my mother, Francis, I've seen a lot of homely babies in my life, but that guy takes the cake. So here I am not two days old and I'm being picked on by people I'm called by names. What a tough life I had. <laughs> and look how well you turned out. <laughs> and look how well you turned out in spite of all yeah. the name calling and bullying. Yeah. <laughs> um, anything else about your grandparents that you can remember? Oh, it says I, here, uh, my father died while duck hunting in a lake. No, not my father. Oh, grandfather. My grandfather okay. did. He was duck hunting a, around Oscoda and fell overboard. And the the family lore is a little bit unclear that he either drowned immediately or he suffered hypothermia and succumbed to that. 
uh, a couple of days later. So I don't know exactly which uh, which is the correct story. How many children were in your family, and where were you in the lineup? I, I, well, I was not the firstborn. I had a sister who was born and lived only a day. Uh, but uh, other than that, I was the eldest, and I had a, a brother who was only 11 months younger than me. We were both born in 1932. He was born on Christmas Day, and always felt that he was shortchanged because of that. Uh, and then I had a sister who uh, uh, came four years after I was born. Lowell's name was Lowell Francis Nelson, Lowell right? Francis, and Francis was my mother's name. I suppose that's, Lowell's would have been Francis like in a male form, whereas, of course, my mother's name would have been feminine. What was Aunt Arla's middle name? Do you remember? Arla? Arla Francis. Oh, Arla <laughs> Francis. Okay. Yeah, just like her mother's. Okay. Uh, what were your brother and sister like? Well, my brother and I, having been born in the same year, only 11 months apart, uh, looked like and were often uh, thought of being as dub uh, twins. And uh, he was more... Mm, husky than I was. I was always skinny. But he had some broader shoulders, and, and but he wasn't as tall as I am. And my sister, well, I don't know any much more than that. She was a girl in those days. Uh, I, I, I didn't pay attention to girls much. That did change. Did change, okay. Describe the house you grew up in. Uh, I grew up in a working class neighborhood. Uh, the houses were, uh, I don't know exactly how to s describe them, uh, main floor. In and De This a, was in Detroit? In Detroit. Okay. The, they had a main floor and then a, uh, always had a basement and had an attic. And uh, uh, the houses were, oh, four, five, no, about seven or eight feet wide. I know, seven or eight feet apart. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, uh, and they were usually uh, made out of lumber and shingles, wooden, or uh, asphalt shingles. And uh, when we lived in a neighborhood, like I say, it was uh, working class. It was also uh, multi-ethnic. We had a family of Italian people, two families of Italian people living down the street from us. There were English people there. There, at that time, were no black people. And uh, I remember vividly the first time I saw and talked to a black boy who was my age. And, uh, and this was in Detroit. Uh, so that... Uh, that's our neighborhood. Uh, there was a Protestant church on the corner of our street, and there was uh, a Catholic uh, church and school, which I attended. Uh, oh, about a quarter to a half a mile away from our house, and uh, we walked that when we were a little bit older <laughs> than first grade, second grade. We then we're expected to walk home. And in those days, you didn't worry about kids like you can today, in the sense that somebody's gonna pick them up or snatch them. Uh, Do you remember what street or what? Yeah, I, what? I can tell you the street and, okay. the, and uh, the number. Well, we lived in 8252 Mataloo. Uh, that, uh, that house, that area was pretty much, has been pretty much leveled since that time, as a matter of fact, I've been leveled uh, since uh, my kids were little, so uh, it's been quite a while. Do you know what's there now? Or? What's there now? Uh, at that time, if you went about uh, an eighth of a, no, a quarter of a mile 
to the east, you would come up on a fence around the Detroit City Airport. And of course, I also vividly remember seeing a Douglas DC-3 sitting on, uh, in or, or on, perhaps both, a building where it had crashed the night before. Ooh. Wow. Um, did you have your own room? No, uh, as a matter of fact, we didn't have a, a room particularly in the summertime. We slept in the attic, and we thought that was great, of course. Uh, did we have a room in the wintertime? I don't remember. We must have had a room of some type, but no. I, in the winter, in the summertime, we slept in the attic. Did it? Did that house have all the, like the modern utilities and conveniences? Uh, no. As a matter of fact, if you wanted ice, you put a card in your window that had a, a on one corner hundred, the other corner fifty, the other corner. Uh, 75, and that indicated to the iceman the number of pounds of ice you wanted. So he would either bring in a full chunk or chop it down to what he thought was 50 or 75 pounds, and and that's what you paid him. Hmm. And we did not have an, uh, a refrigerator. The refrigerator was from the ice that I just spoke. Hmm. Um. What were your family's economic circumstances when you were young? Uh, as I mentioned before, this was in the Depression, and my family lost a lot of money uh, during the Depression. They owned quite a bit of property in Florida, oh. and a, uh, a number of houses in Detroit, and my recollection is that they lost them all. Mm -hmm. Lost every bit of it. I don't know anything about the uh, the uh, property in Florida. Hmm. Um, as a kid, do you remember having to do without things? Or? I wasn't aware of that very much. Uh, no, we lived in that no working class neighborhood, and and they, everybody looked like us and lived like us mm -hmm. that I could tell of at that age. And so, you know, you didn't feel like, uh, I wish I had uh, Rockefeller's money or something like that. We, we had a lot of fun then, the kids did, and did a lot of crazy things, which probably I'll be asked to. <laughs> it's coming right up. <laughs> uh, but first, uh, did you have chores or duties around the house as a kid? Uh, occasionally, you know, you'd help your mother do this or that. Uh, the uh, for me, it was uh, run and get tools for my father. Uh, Lee go get me a hammer, or Lee go get me a, a, a screwdriver. Like I said, the uh, that was quite an education for us to learn names of tools and their function, and uh, that uh, oh, I had to first of all, I had to uh, help start the old Model A. Uh, it belonged to my Uncle Henry, who uh, who was a radio man on ocean-going cargo ships, and when he had a long trip, he would leave his Model A. I'm not sure of that model number, but anyway, and uh, you started it by cranking it, but you also could do something we did often, which was to uh, park it on a little incline. And then my father would push it over till it started rolling. And my job was to let out the clutch at the appropriate time. And so it would, uh, the motor would turn over and start. And the only problem was I had to stop the, the car before it ran through the neighbor's uh, garage because we, lived, we had an alley separating the two garages and the distance wasn't very far. But it was kind of fun <laughs> to be the guy who let out the clutch and started the car. Of course, if you felt like Big Brother. Did you ever hit the neighbor's garage? <laughs> to my knowledge, I never hit <laughs> the neighbor's garage. We did other things to the neighbor's garage, but it wasn't that. Huh. It's interesting you talk about as a kid learning about tools from your dad, because I remember um, 
you having a, a workshop and a wood shop and letting me practice with a jigsaw and things like that. And I and I look back at that and I, that's something I didn't do with my kids. You know, I didn't have a wood shop and I didn't teach them that much about tools. So I have to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you learn to cook? Did I learn to cook? I didn't learn to cook until much later in life uh, when I was a single parent. And I used to enjoy trying to make something neat for my kids on Sunday or weekend. And uh, I learned why women sometimes get disgusted. You work and you work and then the people come in and eat it down and it seems like one or two gulps and they don't say thank you or whatever. But uh, that was my introduction to cooking. And I did cook a bit and went a little older when we were in a deer camp. <laughs> How did you celebrate your birthdays? We, our family tradition was that if it was your birthday, you got to choose the type of meal you wanted, and you got to choose the dessert, usually the cake. And uh, I, I think I tried to continue that uh, when I had kids, but I don't think it lasted very long. <laughs> Matter of fact, I know it didn't. <laughs> Uh, talk a little bit about your experiences with school as a kid. My what? School. Um, experiences going to school. Well, uh, I was not ever going to win a Nobel Prize I, <laughs> because I wasn't that smart and I wasn't that uh, diligent in studying. Uh, uh, we were playing uh, Artie Shaw and uh, Benny Goodman music here uh, a few minutes ago and I felt like I wanted to dance but I felt like the person who gets me to do one dance step should get a Nobel Prize for moving the immovable object and uh, so that segment uh, I was pretty good at, at mathematics uh, I couldn't color worth the darn which we were supposed to be able to do and uh, I will tell you that I have been requested to leave church, church choirs, and my biggest, uh, uh, <laughs> the guy who really tells me how it is when in singing, he says I should sing tenor as in 10 or 12 miles away, or sing solo as solo, nobody can hear me. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, what they have said is true. <laughs> what kind of games or recreation did you do as a kid like to do? Well, we played stick baseball. Uh, we, uh, we ice skated. I'll tell you more about that later. Mm -hmm. And we uh, had what we call rubber gun wars. You could make a, a, a gun by having a, a clothespin and uh, uh, a couple pieces of wood and, uh, uh, and the ribbon of a inner tube. And we used to f fight rubber gun wars uh, that, uh, you know, that didn't hurt anybody, you know, but uh, that it was an activity. And uh, the other thing w we did uh, was make smoke bombs. Uh, in those days, uh, photographic film burned, sorta, and gave off a lot of smoke, so we would wrap a, a roll of film in a newspaper and you could light the end of it and throw it in your opponent's fort or castle, and <laughs> that was part of our chemical warfare. Chemical <laughs> warfare. Uh, did you want to be anything when you grew up as a kid? Did you have uh, like an occupation of the future in mind or anything? I never had uh, that inclination at all until perhaps I was well into high school. Uh, and that was to become a chemist <clears throat> because Dow Chemical is uh, located and headquartered in Midland, Michigan. And then I thought that was, and I'm very conservative, and I thought that was a very, uh, if not lucrative, but stable job. When did you move to Midland? My family uh, moved to 
Midland in 1949, and uh, it was in October or so, and I just made it into uh, for a freshman class in high school. And that, that's all I remember. <laughs> okay. Let's see. What do you remember about going to high school? That was a B in Midland, right? Yeah, that I was in at uh, Midland High, the old Midland High, I might add, because I remember being told my buddy was at Midland High, and without thinking, I went over there until I realized that it had moved two miles or so, and I had forgotten, forgotten about there were two Midland Highs at that time. Hmm. And uh, what uh, was the first part of your question? Oh, just like, um, did you have any particular... Well, hobbies or activities or clubs or anything you were in? I remember vividly that uh, this was in uh, at, right after World War II. <laughs> and during World War II, boys who were of high school age had to take some sort of army physical training. They didn't want you coming there like a marshmallow. So we played uh, tackle football with no pads, no nothing, no helmet, uh, which may account for some of my <laughs> proclivities. And uh, uh, it was very rigorous. The rules were often very different than they are now, particularly for girls. The girls uh, didn't play sports like uh, boys do or like they do now. Uh, their movements were very... Uh, Choreographed. I should not quite say that, but at, at, at any way, they were very different than here. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, than now. <laughs> Did you expect to go to college when you were in high school? Uh, I believe that I am the first member of our family, an extended family, who did go to college. Uh, my father went to the eighth grade and no more. The simple reason was there wasn't any more in those days. Uh, if you, they didn't have high schools at, uh, around the corner like they are today. My mother did go and finish uh, high school, but she had to move in with uh, relatives to do so. Did you work in your when you were a teen? Well, uh, of course, by that time my parents had uh, purchased uh, 40 acres of land, and we uh, worked on that. We raised chickens and pigs and uh, occasional beef uh, that, that uh, we ate. And uh, my brother and I um, picked blueberries in the area that I'm sitting in now, uh, and that uh, we sold at the farmer's market and contributed some of that in some form to the family coffers. Uh, and of course we did work like taking care of the chickens and feeding the pigs or whatever uh, needed to be done on that small level of farming. I raised a beef uh, Hereford uh, cow for a 4-H project or uh, a, a different FFA project and sold it. I've also heard you tell stories that you were working in a bowling alley and this also says a landscaping company. Do you uh, remember well, those? <laughs> it, uh, I did, uh, was a pin boy and uh, in those days uh, they didn't have any mechanical a means of picking up uh, the bowling pins and putting them in their proper places. Now, I worked uh, when I was in high school for uh, a landscaping... Um, uh, well, <laughs> I'm having a little trouble f finding the word. Anyway, I worked for a, a landscaper, and um, uh, he... I won't mention the name of it, and uh, he was a... Uh, Swiss German 
who smoked constantly. He lit one cigarette with the other one. And, uh, and so we did a lot of landscaping. I still have a scar on my finger here that I picked up by sharpening a scythe. Uh, Midland has uh, ordinances, you have to keep your grass below a certain level, and I was cutting it with a sigh on somebody's lot. And as I sharpened the sigh, it moved and cut my, my knuckle open on my left hand so that if I pulled back the skin, I could see a white knuckle underneath it. Um, so I, I did get paid for that. <clears throat> Sometimes I got the magnificent sum of a penny a minute. So I got 60 cents an hour. And But uh, going back to that side business, uh, I was bleeding rather profusely out of that cut. And a woman came out of a nice house over by the golf course. And she said, come on in, come on in. You've got to get that washed out. And I said, ma'am, I can't. I'm bleeding. She said, come on in. Forget it about that blood stuff. So I went in and she cleaned out that. Then I walked down to Main Street uh, to Dr. Shirk's office. He had to be on Main Street then and he fixed me. He stitched it up. So uh, that lady was very, very nice to take me into her very fine home. I didn't, I didn't ask her her name so I can't tell you it right now. But uh, yeah, I got paid in we did buy little things for the house, for the home, maybe a tool, maybe a new hammer, I, I don't remember. Is it true that you got a tractor before you got a car? Is it true that I got a tractor before I got a car? Yes, that is true. Uh, my brother and I got a tractor before we got it. It was a farm all cub, and it uh, had at least as much energy as your washing machine does, but uh, I'm not sure about how much more. And we uh, uh, would go around to people's houses and cut their, uh, cut their grass for them because of that ordinance I spoke of earlier. You had to keep it cut, grass cut down to a certain level. I think that's still true. Yeah. But at any rate, uh, we did that and we also plowed up some land uh, at the corner of uh, uh, Wheeler and what is now uh, uh, a, see, what is that? <laughs> I can't remember the name. It's, uh, uh, I'll come back to it. Anyway, uh, we did that. We plowed that up and planted it into wheat and harvested the wheat and sold that. Uh, right now, I'm 87. And I forget things. What did you? I'm ask fifty me? and I forget things. Huh? I'm fifty and I forget things. I'll cut back up to your folks had forty acres of of farm essentially, right? Well, uh, to call it a farm was to restate the case <laughs> to uh, several powers <laughs> of overstating, uh, because first of all, it was all sand. Yeah. Well, I mean, and it. Uh, where was it? Was it in the, town, the, the, by the, the house town, on the street? Yeah, the, oh, okay. we had a house and a barn, and that house and barn, and maybe some other outbuildings, uh, which was on Swede, almost at the half mile mark between Swede and we, uh, between... Uh, Wheeler and Wackerly? Hmm? Wheeler and Wackerly? Weaver and Wackerly, yeah. yeah. Uh, at any rate, you couldn't, you couldn't make a living on that. But uh, the interesting part of that was one of the prior owners of that property worked at Dow Gardens. And it so happened that some of the plants at the Dow Gardens managed to make the, their way up to our, our uh, property. <laughs> so we were the only people on that street that had some very exotic flowers. <laughs> oh. I don't know if I should say that. Right? That's fine. That's, statute of limitations has run out. Huh? The statute of limitations has run out on many of these <laughs> yeah. misdeeds of yours, so speak freely. I would mention that there were no dinosaurs in there at that time. Uh, what was your social life in high school? Did you start dating? Uh, actually, uh, our social life, uh, as it 
developed was started earlier uh, in uh, you know the late uh, grade school years. Uh, we uh, we played softball at the corner of uh, Wackerly and uh, Foster Road on the grounds of the the school that was there. We uh, we. Well, I, I tell everybody I didn't know what girls were until I was 15. I thought they were just boys who couldn't afford haircuts. And and I borrowed that joke from somebody I have now forgotten. <laughs> At any rate, you know, we hung around with with girls, and some of the guys and girls were just starting to date or at least go around together. Uh, but... Uh, uh, there wasn't any uh, pinning or wearing his ring type of thing at that time. Uh, so, did you start dating in high school? No, I never had a date oh, in really? uh, high school. I mean, you, you know, in parties or something like that, you would sort of be attached to a girl, uh, uh, but. Uh, I, I don't remember having a date, you know. Sometimes I would uh, want this girl to sit with me at the 4-H uh, dinners. Uh, the, it was uh, quite rural in its uh, um, social atmosphere, I would say. Hmm. And uh, we, we, we played baseball or softball all the time. We made our own softball diamonds at the corner of, uh, of uh, Wheeler and Swede and a little further north uh, because the people let us and we played uh, softball there. The, we, that was a, a, one of the largest uh, social activities and the others being brought to us by 4-H or uh, FFA, Little Lovey Heron. Uh, so yeah. Did you go to the movies a lot? Uh, the, I went to the movies a lot more when we lived in Detroit than I ever did uh, in Midland at that time. The, in Detroit, there was always a, a, a matinee. Uh, you could go for a dime. You could see a movie, Perils, Perils of Pauline. Uh, the... Uh, I forget the the fellow who had the Alaska pictures. Uh, help me out, uh, Mitch Rage. Uh, I'm drawing uh, a blank. I don't know. Uh, uh. Okay. Uh, anyway, we can come back to that if necessary. And uh, so, no, I didn't, didn't go to movies. As a matter of fact, to have gone to the movies would have meant going down to Main Street in Midland, whereas at home or at um, in Detroit there was quite a bit closer. Mm -hmm. Do you have a radio at your house? Did you listen to the radio? We, we did have a radio, and one of the memories I have of that time was, uh, I'll combine a couple of things here. My, my aunt and uncle had just moved to a new subdivision in Redford, Detroit, and the, the uh, uh, people were just pouring the curbs at uh, th that time, which happened to be December 7th, and uh, the contractors uh, covered the curbs with straw because you don't want freezing and, and uh, hardening of concrete go hand in hand. And we went, we all went into the, my aunt and uncle's house and noticed the, the solemn somber looks on the faces of the adults. Well, that was particularly true of my aunt and uncles who had uh, 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 well, infantry age, <laughs> ages, uh, uh, so they were liable for the draft, whereas my brother and I were quite a bit younger than that. Mm -hmm. And the reason I remember the radio was it was one of these cathedral type uh, housings and, and the wood was car or cut so that you had the dome like stuff. Mm -hmm. 
statues. Uh, well, not statues. It's the shape of shape. Kind of. Yeah, I know what you mean. Mm -hmm. I, 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 that, yeah, I know what you mean. That, that that style of cabinet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the cabinets were, and uh, but I I remember. Uh, listening and hearing, you know, some I wouldn't call them play-by-plays, but uh, uh, the reports on Pearl Harbor. Hmm. What was the name of your aunt and uncle? My aunt and uh, uh, I'm drawing a blank, but it was an uh, Irish name. They were a typical Irish family, and if you. Uh, uh, there's a book uh, that uh, uh, would have depicted them to the core. I guess one guy should have sto um, sued the other guy for <laughs> stolen goods or something. Uh, their name was Donner, and they lived here, uh, part of the family lived here in Michigan in later years, so you may have run into them. Mm. Okay. And you said at that time they lived in Red... They lived in Redford at the time? At that time, they, they just moved into a new home uh, in Redford, Detroit. And that's why the curbs were being poured and all that. So, hmm. What happened after high school for you? What happened for high school? I graduated from high school when I was 17, which meant I couldn't get a job at Dow like all the rest of my peers did because I was too young to work in that kind of environment where there was you know, danger or whatever from. And so I went uh, and worked at Harvest Bakery uh, and, uh, and, and worked there and also went back to school, but I can get into that later. Uh, I uh, uh, worked at that bakery until Uncle Sam sent me a letter saying that my friends and neighbors had chosen me for this glorious opportunity of being a soldier. <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, I'm not sure what the question was now. Well, just like, what did you do after high school? Well, so I went, I went to the, work there. And then you went and to then, the Army, right? And then I went in the Army. But while I was working at the bakery, uh, my boss, uh, who had a good German name, which I've forgotten. Uh, he said he was going back to take night lessons at the high school. And well, what are you taking? Well, I'm taking chemistry. Well, why are you taking chemistry? Well, because chemistry is going to help you everywhere. Okay. So I thought, well, what the hang? Why don't I do that? And I did. I went back uh, to uh, night school. But unfortunately, the Army had other ideas and took me shortly and thereafter. Did you do like boot camp or something? Oh yeah, your basic training is uh, is required. As a matter of fact, they cannot prosecute you for military crimes if you don't haven't done basic. I didn't know that, and I'm not sure it's true. But at any rate, uh, yeah, I I went into the army sometime around April. My, but at that time, you left from the steps of the post office and on Main Street, and uh, I remember my mother didn't want to go. She didn't, she didn't want to see her baby, her ugly baby, <laughs> uh, being drafted. Uh, I, did, I didn't feel any remorse about going, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, so that started my career as a soldier. That was like the spring of 1950? The spring of 1952. 52? Yeah, the war had been going on for a while. Okay. Because it did indeed start in June 1950. Did uh, Lowell go into the service at the same time? Yeah, but he, he saw me going into the Army, and he didn't want the Army, so he volunteered in the Air Force and uh, spent his whole uh, military career in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. Okay. Lowell being my brother, mm -hmm. my <laughs> nine months younger brother. <laughs> what was it like in the Army? Well, um, 
I think I adapted to the Army quite well, I'm used to being getting up early, get, used to working hard, used to handling guns, mm -hmm. uh, because my father was a hunter and, and my brother and I certainly tried to be hunters, uh, many stories around that topic. Uh, some of them true. Uh, so that's um, that's what uh, uh, my introduction was, and I was sent to. Uh, of course, you're you're handled several times. Uh, we did something Fort Wayne, and then they shipped us off to <clears throat> Kalamazoo or Yips. You know, not Ypsilanti, but Kalamazoo area, Grand Rapids area, before they shipped us down to uh, uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky. And I think that was probably one of the first times I had been out of Michigan, if not the first time. And then you went to the Panama Canal to get no, the, no, no, no. Uh, no you... uh, I from uh, I took basic training in Fort Knox. Okay. And uh, I had worked, as I mentioned, at Harvest Bakery, and wonder of wonders, they sent me to Baker School uh, in the Army at Fort Knox. So um, that was kind of nice because you got a lot of good goodies to eat, and uh, uh, and I enjoyed it. And we uh, uh, we occasionally had a buddy or two who had a car, and we could go riding around uh, Kentucky, and uh, that was interesting. Like I say, I'd never been out of the of Michigan, but. Uh, uh, the uh, country was, in, of course, entirely different than Michigan. It was hilly and pretty and green uh, and hot. We actually had one guy in, die in with basic training overheated and they never got him back. Uh, but then an edict came down, you know how the Army is, ready, fire, aim, uh, which meant that they worked after the fact rather than before it. And that was one of the cases. Uh, I don't know, I didn't know the boy, nor did, not even his name. So anyway, I enjoyed uh, uh, Army life for the most part, and it gave me material to tell stories and jokes all the rest of my life. <laughs> you were deployed to Korea? I was deployed, uh, from uh, Seattle, mm. and they sent you overseas by boat in those days. You didn't fly you over. And uh, so we left uh, uh, from Seattle, and it's interesting that one of my friends at that time was from Saginaw, George Peshek by name, and George could not look at a waving leaf without getting seasick. I mean, he, he was... He was the saddest man to look at when he was on that boat. But uh, at any rate, uh, uh, we made it across, and we were in the Pacific, and we were going across the Pacific, and it usually was just as clear as glass. But when it wasn't, poor George really had a tough time. So we ended up in Yokohama, uh, and then they shipped us to what's called a rebel devil which is shorter, fancy for replacement de depot. We were replacements for people who were shipping back to the United States. They'd serve their time, or they uh, uh, had not made it. And so, uh, so we ended up in uh, Yokohama for a couple of days until they decided where we should be going in Korea. And then uh, we got on that boat again, the same one, uh, which uh, uh, took 36 hours of going through the various channels between Yokohama and, and Busan. And I, I should mention that, uh, no, I, I can't mention it because I just forgot it. And uh, so they, sh they obviously knew we were coming and uh, we were, I was shipped to, in Pusan, to the 110th uh, Quartermaster Bakery. 
So that was where I was deployed to when I first hit Korea. How long were you there? In Korea yeah. or in uh, Korea. Busan? In Korea in general. In Korea, I uh, left Korea in April of 1952. So uh, I was there, what, just a little over two years. Okay. Did you go on R&R &R to Japan? Yeah, I went on R&R &R in Japan, I would say, two, maybe three times. And uh, What was that like? Very, very interesting. Uh, of course, uh, I had had a little introduction to Asian culture um, by being in, in Busan for 15, 20, 30 days or a month or so. Anyway, uh, uh, you know, um, my buddies and I, did not partake of the local uh, sins, <laughs> and uh, so we we had a very enjoyable time. I, I remember we got in, and then we the first thing we did was get on a train to go up to uh, Lake Chuzanji, which happened to be the summer palace of the the Empire of Japan, and uh, and it was uh, interesting to ride the train because in those days. Everybody and everybody got on the same train, and uh, uh, no, no, had, sometimes they had an animal for a companion, and uh, Japanese were very uh, pleasant to us, offering us sake, which I had never even heard of prior to that, and uh, maybe even trying to talk to us in sign language. And, and then we stayed there, and you know, it's a mountainous country, and uh, entirely different than our thing. I remember looking back down the staircase type road that we climbed up and thinking, oh my Lord. <laughs> and uh, I remember one night uh, I liked to walk, so I was walking out along the shores of the lake and there was this Japanese guy fishing. And he was scared to death that I was a DNR type person and I was gonna haul him in. But at once, you know, I. I knew about five words of Japanese at that time, so I wanted to, uh, konnichiwa, and things like that, uh, which means good afternoon, not good evening. I've forgotten that not already. So at any rate, uh, he realized that we, uh, he, he was safe. So he sat down with me on the bank and uh, banks of the river, and, uh, and he pointed to a light across the lake, and, he, and then he, uh, he pointed to himself. Me, me, just like me, he's over there stealing fish. <laughs> so we, we, we uh, had a little something in common. And I remember the uh, one night I again went out walking and uh, a, a geisha in full geisha uh, clothing was, was there, it was darkish. And I think she was afraid of me. And, uh, and I just said again some two, three words in Japanese. And she went on, and I went on. So uh, the other thing uh, that we learned is uh, to don't use uh, charcoal for a heater; it'll kill you. Uh, carbon monoxide. And anyway, uh, that's uh, when I uh, played John Wayne. Never had ridden a horse in my life, but part of the the, the Activities at this place we were at, it was uh, run by GI, I mean the Army. Um, they had horses there, and one of the guys in the, that was there had ridden horses. So anyway, got on a horse, and, and uh, he was telling us all about how to ride a horse, and the horse promptly threw him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, uh, we enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun uh, and, you know, a new life, new culture. Uh, and uh, I remember one a time I had a camera and we were walking down the street someplace and this Japanese woman dressed in traditional Japanese clothes uh, stopped me and asked me to take her picture, which I did. And then uh, we got back to Korea, I had it developed, and one of the, Jap the Korean guys 
uh, spoke Japanese, and uh, this woman had given me uh, her mailing address. Of course, I couldn't read it. And uh, uh, he sent it over to this lady, and I got a nice thank you note back. She said, oh, I now realize that how honorable American soldiers are. Because, you know, in, in Asia, I mean, uh, they would, in the early days, they would raid a, uh, uh, a movie house, take all the eligible men off to the war, and you, you know, and sometimes it got pretty brutal. Anyway, uh, so, and then we went back to, uh, to Tokyo, Yokohama. There were something like 18 million people living in that area. You couldn't tell Yokohama from, from uh, uh, Tokyo. You just melded together. Well, I think probably the same thing happens here in big cities. Uh, and lo and behold, we're walking down the Ginza, Fifth Avenue, I guess you'd call it, uh, and who is there but Andy Anderson, one of my friends from Midland, and I played basketball with him on the adult league here in Midland, and had gone through high school with him. I was walking down the street, and so I tell my mother this, and she calls his mother, and they get together every time they get a letter and tell tell each other what was happening and all. I have not seen Andy Anderson since since 1953, <laughs> I guess it was by then. So, uh, small world. Uh, you can run into a, a friend in the midst of 18 million people, or whatever it was. So, What that, else do you remember about being in the Army? What I learned about being in the Army? Or remember oh, anything, yeah. Anything? Oh, uh, uh, well. Uh, I got a, oh, I learned about uh, how lucky I was to be in that quartermaster corps because we had everything we wanted uh, to eat, to wear. Uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, we had entertainment because <laughs> we had a movie projector and we could watch movies. and. Uh, uh, we had uh, some activities like volleyball, which is pretty easy. Uh, I have some remembrance of uh, how our little camp, oh, maybe a hundred guys or not many more than that, maybe not that many, uh, sponsored a Korean uh, uh, orphanage, which was right behind us. And those guys used to take their time and a lot of times their money and spend it on those kids. Uh, they're, uh, you know, the GIs had a big heart. So I was impressed by that. And what else? Uh, oh, I, in, in our company, I met a, a fellow from, uh, a black fellow from, from Michigan, Detroit. And he and I talked and hit it off pretty well. Uh, I remember his name. I'm not sure I should say it. Uh, sure. Uh, his name was Eben Hanna. And uh, he was a big man, but I was a little man. But I remember, you know, we could ch chat about Detroit. And uh, he was a nice guy. He was uh, an old regular army man. We. We call regular army RAs, and, uh, and we used to have a little chant that we would chant. When we hiked uh, RA all the way. Uh, <laughs> was derogatory in the way if somebody did something that was pro army. We would tell them RA all the way because uh, we didn't intend to make that our, li our life's work. <laughs> so we, we were kind of anxious to get on with it. Okay. Uh, there's one other thing that I remember mm -hmm. that uh, I'm here with Warren, and Warren and his family came over oh a couple of weeks ago, and we just had dinner. Warren cooked, and we lived. Uh, anyway, uh, after they left, I felt 
a fe I had a feeling of pure joy. I can't explain it. It's, but the other time that I had a feeling of pure joy, just suffused all through my body, was when the day that the uh, somebody came out into uh, the yard at the bakery and said, "Lee, your papers have come," it means I was going home. And uh, it lasted quite a while that I, I would love, if you could b bottle that up and sell it, you would, there'd be no need for opioids or any other drug like that. It's just the most beautiful feeling in the world. And I read about these mystics and religious people who have that feeling, and I can see, well, I can see why they feel that way. Uh, I mean, they live their lives the way they do. So, I think it'd be a good time to take a little break. I'm gonna have something to drink, <laughs> so. I'm gonna say I'll take my drink home with me. Okay. <laughs> I, go I mean, ahead. Uh, if you're gonna get up, I need to un- You need take, to one? Take, if you're gonna stand up and move, I gotta take your mic off, because so, you're wired up. No, I'll sit here. I'll okay, sit here. I'm just gonna yeah. grab a drink and check on the camera real fast. Oh, I'm going to have to tell Cindy she should get hire you to wire up everybody. That was quick. I'm a quick guy. It's getting dark to... outside, hasn't it? I don't want to stay here all night, but we can do this again if we don't finish. We so could do one. We could do this again if we don't yeah. finish. Yeah, oh, sure. Stuff. Okay, so we're back. Oh, I've got to check one thing. There we go. Okay, we're back. So uh, Lee's in the Army in Korea. And then he gets his papers, and then... And then we got on a boat again, and we were supposed to uh, uh, stop off at Hawaii and uh, drop off some of the people from Hawaii, and then go on from there to Panama Canal, and from there on up to the, in the New York area. I forget now the name of the naval base. Uh, or Norfolk, I think it was. And uh, so that's what uh, did from from that point on, but uh, the uh, boat that, uh, ironically, that took us back to the United States was the same boat that took me from Japan to Korea. And incidentally, uh, on the boat, Going from Seattle to Yokohama, there were more women and children dependents going over than there were soldiers. And there was a contingent of Canadian soldiers on that boat too. So the you know, the United Nations was heavily involved in the Korean War. And then they were part of that, as were we. How did you end up at Michigan Agricultural College? <laughs> I ended up uh, at Michigan Agricultural College, and that's what it was when, when I got there, um, in a circuitous way. Uh, I belong to the FFA, Future Farmers of America organization, because at that time there was a lot of farming going on around, there still is. And uh, at any rate, uh, the FFA, used to take us d down to Michigan State every now and then to practice, uh, say, cattle judging or poultry judging or whatever subject they had in mind for us. And uh, uh, so we would go down there quite often as I was somewhat familiar with it. And uh, now I've forgotten the question again. How did you end up at Michigan Agricultural College out of the Army? So, uh, well, uh, having been 
exposed to Michigan State and uh, uh, having that gentleman at the bakery tell me that I should study chemistry, uh, I thought, you know, I would go someplace not too far from home. Hi, Mom, here's some clothes to wash. <laughs> um, any rate, uh, I, I got there for another reason, to be blunt about it, is that Michigan State was very lenient about my academic re uh, record in high school, uh, which did have a good ending uh, the, the senior year because I got glasses. I could see what time was going on. Anyway, uh, uh, so I went to Michigan State like many, many other guys did because Michigan State was willing to take a chance on, you know, that I wouldn't fall flat on my face. And uh, I remember uh, Michigan State, I mean, uh, middle and high, used to just send uh, teachers uh, to Michigan State to check up on s students that they had had. And uh, so I was there, and I'm going to be bragging a little bit, I apologize. Uh, I was there, and this teacher, whose name I won't mention, turned out to be the gentleman who flunked me in algebra, and rightly so, I might add. Uh, and he looked at my, you know, the things I had been taking and what I had done, and in that particular uh, segment uh, of college, I had a 3.92, I think it was, uh, grade point average, and I was taking uh, chemistry and math. Uh, now, I took remedial math, because uh, as I just alluded to, I flunked algebra. Anyway, because uh, uh, I like to read books during class. And at uh, any rate, uh, he looked at that, and uh, I didn't say anything, but he took his glasses off and he said, oh my, my, you seem to have done pretty well. <laughs> I kind of smiled inwardly, of course, congratulating myself. And uh, I didn't hold anything against him for flunking me in algebra because it was well deserved, I can tell you. At any rate, so uh, that's why I got to Michigan State. Well, since I was older, I became a resident advisor. And lo and behold, one day, this guy walks up uh, when the in people, incoming people, not people who had already been through one year of college, walked up to me and he told me his name. And I said, hey, you know, you and I are distant cousins. And yeah, yeah. Well, what are you doing here? And he said, oh, I just got out of the Army or something like that. And they took him, in, uh, the Army, or the Michigan State did, and I, I don't think his, his his academic record was much better than mine. He graduated with honors in in engineering. So um, the, I always felt good about Michigan State for doing that, for taking a, taking me in, taking Ron in, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me. His name, by the way, was Ron Essenmacher. It's a good German name. And uh, I have lost contact with him since then, but uh, uh, I had a lot of fun times at Michigan State. And, uh, and like I say, well, I would go into a classroom sometime and I was, uh, there was only one girl in the class because all these veterans are coming back and flushing out or fleshing out their, uh, their academics. And, uh, so uh, I uh, felt at home because there were a lot of ex-GIs in that in that crowd and in that boat, <clears throat> and I I enjoyed being a resident advisor and I had a lot of stories to tell about that experience. So oh, such as <laughs> such as oh, uh, crossing the Red River or Red the Cedar River or the Red, yeah Cedar River in springtime and falling through and uh, uh, having to tell uh, another another uh, guy in my group at Michigan State that his father had died. Uh, something I don't 
want to do every day for sure. <laughs> but I mean, you know, you learn that 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 has to be done, and sometimes you got to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope that's not overstating the case, but yeah, I, I worried a little bit about how he would react. He took it well. Uh, another sidebar to this is uh, when I got home, and I have mentioned my father was a Keep pretty going. terrible, Keep going. pretty terrible soldier. But when I got home, he wanted me to wear my army uniform everywhere. <laughs> he was so proud that I had been a soldier. And uh, and so I felt good for him on that. <laughs> uh, how did you get to Purdue? How did I get to Purdue? Well, uh, everything's a little bit hazy. But one of the reasons that I went to Purdue was that there was a professor there who did work in with uh, silicon chemistry, mm -hmm. and that and I wanted to work for Dow Corning or Dow, and I was prepping myself with a uh, a silicon chemistry background before I went to those companies, uh, although I had no connection to them at that time other than knowing where they were. Uh, so that's how I got there. And that uh, man's name was Professor Robert, uh, oh, forget, <laughs> I'll come to it. Anyway, he was a very, very good teacher, because a lot of times you don't, you get teachers that are just plain terrible. Uh, but he was an excellent one and so good that at the end of the, the semester, every student in there got up and, and clapped. Hmm. And it, you don't see that very often. I'll ask my son here, who's been through college, that, that how often did that happen? His name was Robert Benkesser. Another bunch of Germans out there. And I had a German language teacher there. His, his name was Steinmetz. <laughs> uh, I think at one time, I, you showed me a card that you maybe had an internship at Dow Corning in the 1950s before you worked there? Yeah, oh, well, every, uh, during the summer you could get a summer job at Dow Corning. Uh, and uh, at that time, uh, you know, I didn't have a very um, deep background in chemistry, nor were my lab skills uh, very polished, to, to say the least. but. You got in there to see how how it works in an industrial environment, and um, uh, s what some of the other people did. And I, c I can still remember that the one compound I worked on was a fairly successful commercial chemical. It had to do with uh, anchoring fiberglass and things like fiberglass boats and whatever to the resin uh, base or that that was used for the form of the thing. Uh, I can remember the name of the, the compound too. Uh, it was Z6030, very difficult uh, compound to make at that time. They may have developed different, excuse me, Techniques now. Remember the joke was Z6030 is a great chemical. It's only got a few problems. One you can't keep it. <laughs> one you can't keep it in a jar, and one can't you can't sell it or something like that. They were making fun of it, and uh, I met a lot of nice people there. So you graduated with a master's degree from Purdue. Yes, mm. and w went to Dow Corning from there. Okay. Worked as a research uh, chemist. I worked with uh, oh some of the big names in chem in uh, uh, organic silicon chemistry. I even shook hands with Doctor. Uh, I forget his name too. I'm having troubles here. 
Uh, was he a chemist? Or? Yeah, he was a chemist. He was Russian. And they sent him over, you know, just to review American methods and whatnot. And I met him. So I got to shake, shake hands with one of the very top silicon chemists in the world. Not, not that they'd ever bought me a cup of coffee, but it, I can say that. And uh, uh, so. Did you uh, meet anybody or date anybody while at Purdue? Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I honestly and sometimes tearfully wish I could live over again uh, those days or just a second life so that I could apologize to one individual in particular whom I misjudged entirely and would love to have had her as a wife, and I am not going to tell you her name, but uh, That's fine. my mother would have been so happy with that woman. She was she had a German name as German as it could get. She was a devout Roman Catholic, and uh, uh, it, it would have fit with her idea of the ideal. <laughs> Mate for Lee. <laughs> Where, was, I, I, alas, it didn't come to pass, and it was my fault. Was was it important? Was what your parents thought? Uh, did who your parents thought you should be dating was that important to you, or, uh, or did you not care at all? Or uh, well, uh, it was more of the latter. You know, uh, having worked at that uh, quote farm. You know, and, and an integral member of it, you were depended upon to do certain things. My father was getting old, and uh, so you ended up with a little bit uh, of bargaining power, if I may use that term. Uh, you were more independent than you ever were before because you knew you you had value, you had, were needed, you... you uh, could get away with things. Uh, so uh, anyway, I I, uh, I remember that I didn't date in high school. So it, I did have a date or two, and my doggone sister would then go next morning and tell my mother who I dated <laughs> and what I did. Sneaky. <laughs> she had a, a was it a grapevine? Uh -huh. <laughs> So, anyhow. So you met Nancy at Purdue? I met Nancy at Purdue. Uh, okay. uh, uh, I had a class that got out in the afternoons. Uh, by the way, I was a, an assistant to the professor, not an assistant professor, but an ass assistant too, and there's a big difference. At any rate, uh, I walked into the Newman Club, which is a Catholic club at, at Purdue and all over, I guess, and there was a, two girls in there, and uh, one of them I knew slightly, so I said, hi, Eileen, and she introduced me, and that was that. Uh, it was ironic because uh, both that girl and the girl I married, Nancy, uh, were working in a uh, genetics lab. I'm not sure exactly what they, their function or job was, but it had to do with the fruit flies, the, the workhorse of genetics. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's how we met. And that's, well, I can go on from there, but... <laughs> Well, what happened next? Did you move to Chicago? Huh? Did you move to Chicago after Purdue? Or? No, no, no. Uh, Nancy graduated, and she got a job at uh, the National Laboratory at just outside of Chicago. What a, I forget it starts with an A, but I can't remember. Uh, I'll look it up if you like. And at any rate, uh, I was finishing my master's at Purdue 
and she was working at this laboratory. Abbott, was it Abbott Labs? Anyway, uh, so I would drive down on a Friday evening, stay at the University of Chicago dormitory uh, as a student, I guess I was allowed to stay there, and then get up the next morning and, uh, and take off for Purdue and work on my master's. Then I would come back on Saturday, uh, or yeah, I'd do that Friday and come back on Saturday and Nancy and I would go out to dinner or do something and then the next day I'd drive back in my one lung Ford car, it was the smallest car they made, <laughs> but it got the job done. Hmm. And uh, so we, we corresponded that way by being together for a limited amount of time. Uh, and that's where somebody broke into my car one time, stole all my clothes. <laughs> and I remember the policeman who came to answer the, the call. He asked me where I was from, and, he, and I told him, and he said, well, uh, you know what Chicago's like now. He said, uh, it's not like Midland. <laughs> You can't leave stuff in plain sight. I didn't take it out. I left it in the trunk or back of the car, and somebody broke in and took everything. So they are now the poorest crooks in <laughs> Chicago. <laughs> uh, so so uh, then you graduated from Purdue, and then what did you do? Well, I had already lined up a job at Dow Corning. Mm. Uh, before I left Purdue. I, uh, the other way I got to Dow Corning was that they would send out one of their uh, headhunters and uh, the headhunter whom I knew fairly well would call me up and say, hey Lee, let's go have dinner. Well, that's like being asked into heaven when you're a graduate student and no money. And he would take me out to Binces, not the Binces around here, but that's what it was. And it was a, a, a lobster crab house. And uh, he had, the guy, the headhunter had been in the army. So uh, we would sit there and have lobster, which was about several levels above my <laughs> income level. And, uh, and I would be sure to tell war stories because he loved war stories because he'd been there and uh, and he kept it he would say well have another drink I never was much of a drinker and I wanted to put on a good show to, to get a job at Dow Corning I'm holding on to the edge of my chair to stay upright and uh, oh no 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 so anyway uh, <laughs> that that is another way that I got into Dow Corning I won't mention the gentleman's name but uh, it's all right. The, uh, the statute of limitations. Huh? The statute of limitations has run out on anything. <laughs> well, illegal. the other, other reason I won't mention his name is because I forgot. Oh, no, oh. I do remember it somewhat. I will in a minute, anyway. So. Uh, so did you move pretty directly to Midland? Huh? Did you move directly to Midland well, once you graduated? Well, uh, let's see. Well, Nancy and I were married in. Uh, South Bend, and uh, okay. of course, you know all the uh, the the kids we went around with. There were a lot of them mar marrying and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I remember, you know, I told you I I didn't marry that girl earlier, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, went to the church to watch to attend the wedding. And when I walked outside, there was that girl's mother. And if looks could kill, I would not be here today. Mm -hmm. Interesting. <laughs> but like I say, uh, dumbest thing I did. And I won't even tell you why. That's all right. Huh? That's OK. I will you, not you, tell you why. You don't have to say anything you don't want to. Well, so like then I you say, moved to Midland? Yeah, then Nancy and I moved to Midland. And uh, like 1960, this must have been. Must have been in the 1960s, okay. because I was still at Dow Corning. 
I changed jobs at Dow Corning in 1963. Give me a little room on that. Uh, they offered me the uh, managership of a small uh, department in the uh, research department, uh, within the research department. So I took it. And anyway, uh, after Nancy and I were married, uh, we moved into uh, a, an apartment building where several Dal Corning people were living. And it's ironic because uh, my stepdaughter's now living in the same building as <laughs> buildings as we did. And uh, of course, I had fond memories of that uh, uh, that era too, because, like I say, there were a lot of Dow Corning people there. I was in a ride pool with uh, some of them, and uh, it was uh, it was just a nice time, nice time. And I I remember, you know, watching my son. Excuse me, my daughter was not born then. Uh, Learned to walk, and that was a lot of fun, good memories. And of course, being here uh, in Midland, uh, I felt right at home. And if I want to get my grandson, sons, plural, or granddaughter uh, into a, a mood, all I got to say to them is, when I was your age in Midland, <laughs> tell them stories about how Midland used to be, and they roll their eyes, but they're very good about it. <laughs> they have not thrown cabbages at me anyway. <laughs> That's the truth, isn't it? Yeah, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Don't count your chickens, I reserve the right. Um, when did you... You built the house on Swede, 5519 Swede? Uh, 5401 Swede. No, 5519. Uh, oh, it was 55. That was 1965. Okay, yeah. yeah. Well, Nancy and I... Because you had the apartment first. Yeah. Uh, uh, I had uh, the property uh, at 5519 Swede by virtue of the fact that my father uh, had subdivided it uh, that parcel of land we've been talking about. And so uh, it, it was cheap and we were poor ex-students and so we took it. And uh, uh, there, had, there was an identical home within that area, but I'm not sure where it was. I might be able to pick it out. And Nancy, Nancy liked it so much and she uh, wanted one like it, and so that's what we got. And uh, uh, by that time, Megan had been born. No, uh, Douglas had been born, and, uh, and then I have memories of, you know, their earliest days there, <laughs> his and and uh, Megan's. Yeah, and then I came along in 1968. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, he did. Uh, I'm trying to fit together. Uh, it must have been Megan's birthday. We asked some people across the seat if they would uh, be babysitters for uh, our children, and they said, yeah. And uh, uh, they did that, and when uh, when Megan was born, uh, I rushed back home because Nancy was still at the hospital, and uh, and then there was a knock on the door. And I went there, and there was a woman there, and she said, "I I'm working for the the uh, board of education. I, I'm taking a census of how many children." you have, or they, you have in this home. And I said, well, and how old are they? And I said, well, I got one daughter, and she's about six hours old. Ha <laughs> 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 ha. Yeah. And I remember that day for another reason. One was a beautiful May day, and there was this gorgeous 
rooster pheasant out in the Godal Gardens and the sun shining on him and uh, it was a beautiful day and I have a new, I have a daughter now, a pretty complete family until Warren added to it. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, Man, I did not say to her or any other of my children, he or she is the ugliest child I've ever Hey, seen. good job. Good job. <laughs> you broke the cycle of abuse there. Uh, what do you remember when, about uh, when the kids, your kids were really young? What was difficult and what did you enjoy? Well, the first difficulty that came up was I had a son who wanted me to walk him one night, and and he knew if you, and I first I try, well I'm tired. I'm going to rock him, and I'll sit down and rock him in a rocking chair. No way, Charlie. Then I got up and uh, and uh, did other tricks to keep him amused, but none of it's pacified that youngster, and uh, consequently. Uh, uh, we didn't get much sleep that morning. At least I didn't. <laughs> that wasn't me. Yeah, it was uh, you uh, with a capital Y. <laughs> oh, man. Dear me. Uh, but in a way, I was happy for that because it indicated he had a certain awareness. And, you know, you always worry, is my kid going to be normal? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and the answer was no, but he's active. <laughs> There, I got even with my grandmother, so anyhow. Um, in the 1970s, you went to Germany for work sometimes, didn't you? Well, at that time, uh, um, Dow Corning had a, a, a agreement, several agreements with Wacker Kami in uh, Munich, München. Uh, and sometimes I would go over there and sometimes they would send somebody back here, which was very interesting and uh, fun because you got to meet somebody on a real personal level from a different culture, which happened to be your ancestral sources. And uh, so I, and like that, I remember having a German fellow over one time and he locked himself out of his car. So he was very irate and started talking or saying things in German, which he did not know I understood, or he probably wouldn't have said them. Anyway, he ended up breaking a, a window to get in his car, and I'm sure that Wacker Kami paid for it. And I, uh, you know, had a, a another very enjoyable time in in Europe, in Germany. I could speak enough German that I could get along, uh, but uh, I'll tell you, it's sort of a, an amusing thing. My wife and I went right back to that same little town in Germany, uh, and we, at that time my wife and I liked to hike a lot. So we hiked in, in western United States, and, and, uh, but over, we went over there, and, we, and so I wanted to get a, a map. and. Uh, so I went in this little store, and I said to the proprietress in my best German, Wir wollen eine Landkarte kaufen, which to me meant we want to buy a map. And she looked at me <laughs> quizzically, and she said, Sind Sie Niederländer? Are you a Dutchman? <laughs> and I didn't know whether that was a compliment or a put-down, so I... <laughs> I have never found out, but you can tell you, my audience can tell me. Because <laughs> yeah. I remember the reason I knew that, I knew what a map was. We had been that summer or summer before in uh, not Arches, but what is the other big national park out Joshua there? Joshua Tree? Huh? Joshua Tree? Or, no, no, no. Uh, uh, it was, anyway, yeah. I'll think of it. Uh, and this German lady came up and asked me something about <laughs> <laughs> Alain Carte, and I knew that it, she was looking for a map. And I don't know what I told her or what happened there, but at any rate. Uh. <laughs> I remember as a kid in the 70s getting postcards from you from München. München, yeah. Um, 
Yeah. And I remember listening to a, a record yeah, you, album. You, you collected stamps at that yeah. time. Mm -hmm. no. Yeah. And I remember you had a record album I would listen to. It was like oh, pop Oh, I songs, still have it. Yeah. And there was that song, Liebe, Glück und Sonnenschein. Yeah. 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 Son, Sonnenschein. Sonnenschein. And Sonnenschein. Love, luck, and sunshine. Right? Yeah. yeah. And so I just remember listening to some of those songs. And, and You know, I, uh, I have uh, Aetna for one of my medical prov providers, uh, drugs, and uh, they will send you uh, descriptions of the drug and or so everything about the drug in, in several languages. And I, I always try to read it in uh, Spanish and German. And I can still remember some words. <laughs> but none of the ones the German man told me when I was watching him pound out the window in his car. <laughs> Ah, yeah. So, so the seventies. You're you're working at Dow Corning. Yeah. Your kids are growing up. They're in middle school, and you get divorced, right? 1974, 1975, something like that. I don't really remember it, okay. uh, but I will tell you that uh, my wife and I have, my first wife and I, have sat down and talked out those days and we agree that we both were stupid that uh, we let uh, anger ego take over at the worst possible time and I think I can speak for well I know I can speak for Nancy and uh, because we've talked about that and uh, obviously regrettable, not only for me, but for, for the children, my three kids. Uh, I remember my youngest son when, uh, when I came over that evening after Nancy had told him, and uh, he grabbed me and tried to hit me. <laughs> and uh, you know that, that was just natural, I think, and that he would feel that I was abandoning him. But I tried, honestly, not to abandon them, to be involved in some ways, you know, in their life. Uh, uh, always went to your award dinners, uh, got fatter as a result. <laughs> Oh. But in, you know, in sports with Doug, and I don't remember exactly, what, you know, what, what my uh, approach was with uh, Megan. I remember one episode. Did I ever tell you about the time uh, Megan was there with her friend Laura? They were about nine, ten years old. I don't remember, and I wanted you to do something. And you weren't quite ready to do it. <laughs> and you would say, just a sec, Dad, just a sec. Or undo this. Just a sec, Dad, just a sec. Well, I lost it, and I, I guess I got angry, and I said, Warren, no more sex. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. Your sister and Laura keeled over That's with funny. laughter. They were just uh, out of this world. <laughs> And I didn't realize what I was saying or how it would sound. <laughs> uh. Well, I got a text from Lori saying that we should probably wrap it up here and get headed back to town. Yeah. So let's take a break from the oral <laughs> history recording and... Uh, Finish. Agreed to do it again if something. Yeah, let's do it again. And so we kind of left off in the 70s. We have to do the rest of the 70s, the 80s, and, and forward and stuff like that. But this has been good. I, I, I thought uh, there's one story that uh, I have told Cindy, uh, the girl that's doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Not girl, woman. There you go. <laughs> About the first... And I emphasize the only time I have been in a house of ill repute. Oh. <laughs> and it, it could have been called the story 
of errors or the comedy of errors, but maybe someday I should tell you. Okay. I mean, I, I, it wasn't to use the <laughs> facilities. It Just was, to use the bathroom, huh? <laughs> not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm only here to use the bathroom. I'm only here to use the bathroom. Oh, God. Take that is so um, uh, incredible, that story. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, don't forget it and save it for the next time. I won't forget it, for believe me. So believe signing me. off for this episode of Oral History Interviews. <laughs> <laughs> it's Warren and Lee, up in the woods. Uh, Bye. Okay. Okay, you're going to drive me back home. Yes, so I... hold on. Stay right there. i got to <laughs> unpack all this stuff or repack it.